Hey guys, welcome back to the Godly Beer Podcast. That means black sheep in Urdu. Today's topic is going to be not being able to fast in Ramadan due to any health issues. So this can mean a wide variety of things. It can be mental health and needing to take medicine for that. It can be mental health and not taking medicine for that. Like some people's mental health just goes really, really bad and potentially life-threatening um, depending on certain triggers, which I know that fasting is a trigger for a lot of people with eating disorders. So I know that people with eating disorders cannot fast. People with other chronic health issues cannot fast. Physical health issues cannot fast. People that have to take medicine at a specific time that can't be adjusted cannot fast. Like there's a wide variety of things. And I think that's a very isolating experience not being able to fast. So I wanted to bring on a guest today who also is unable to fast during Ramadan and kind of hear her experience and then also share my experience and we can kind of compare experiences. And I'm hoping that this will be an educational thing for everyone because like I said, it is very isolating. And I think people don't quite understand what it feels like to be in that position. But let's bring on my guest. I'll let her share her name if she wants to. And we can hear what she has to say. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Tired, but I'm good. <laughs> I feel you. I've been tired all day, but like I've been gathering my energy. So because I was so excited about this podcast today. I know I'm so excited too. And I'm so, so grateful that you agreed to be on because like this, I really, really wanted this to be a topic, but like mm-hmm. no one was willing to be on. And I was just like, I really want to do it before Amazon ends too, because I want people to learn something from it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so important. So yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. So do you want to like introduce yourself a little? You don't have to say anything you're uncomfortable saying. Like I said, like this is totally whatever you're comfortable with. But yeah, do you want to like introduce yourself a little? Yeah, of course. So my name is Iram. And if you can't tell by the accent, I'm from England. Um, I'm actually really close to um, where Wes is from. And my best friend actually knew him back in the day. So it's so crazy. Um, and yeah, I um, became friends with Urwa after watching her TikToks. And I was like, let me just slide in the DM. She sounds so cool. And yeah, here we are. <laughs> I know it was so crazy that she like knew him. But like, it was funny because I, I mentioned this to you too. Is like, when you messaged me, I felt like I knew you already. Mm, I was like, why because as soon as I saw your post and the way you kind of I don't know the way you are online I was like this is so refreshing like why is this girl not in my life (laughs) (laughs) that's so sweet thank you um yeah I'm glad that I'm glad that you messaged and I'm glad that we kind of became friends because it's nice to it's nice to have you there because you I, I do like the way that you are as well I feel like we're very similar in our ways of thought yeah definitely like I have I think I have about two or three Muslim female friends in the UK but um it's just so nice to have someone else who I'm really similar to and I feel like there are so many things we agree on even controversial things I well, know well, yeah definitely yeah okay so let's just jump right in because I I don't want to keep you here like all day I'd feel really bad um so the first question I have is what do you have that prevents you from fasting so I have Hodgkin's lymphoma which is a form of blood cancer it affects um it has quite a young population so people from about 18 to 35 and I got diagnosed on um the 8th of March but I would say that I've been feeling the symptoms of it since about early January so yeah because of that I've not been fasting oh I'm sorry to hear that though I know that you were mentioning like you you were very scared about that yeah it was like it was honestly I don't know it's it's something that you never think will happen to you and you know some days I'm like okay I've come to terms with the fact that I have cancer um and there are some days where I'm just like sobbing and it's yeah. really heartbreaking because to be honest um I feel like I'm a very I, I don't know if it would be intuitive person but I'm very in touch with myself mm-hmm. and Um, I would say about the month before I was diagnosed, I kind of had an idea that I did have cancer. And I was kind of warning my family, trying to like drip feed the news to them. But everyone was like, no, you don't have cancer. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, But I was just getting quite upset because um, I don't know, you never think that you'll have cancer. And it's, it's the type of cancer I have. I'm never going to be able to like donate blood or if I ever need blood, if, you know, God forbid I get into a car accident and 
I'm losing a lot of blood. It has to be radiated blood. Oh. So there's, yeah, yeah. There's so many things that it's going to impact my life. But um, inshallah, you know, Allah will take care of me and I'll get through this. Inshallah, yeah. But wow, I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it had to be. And I'm sure that w how would they get that, though, if people aren't allowed to donate blood if they have cancer? Would it have to be like someone who's recovered but had radiation before? Um, No. So actually, we're not allowed to donate blood or um, even organs. So mm -hmm. what happens is they take blood and they radiate it. And then they would do the blood transfusion. Yeah, I had no idea about this. I was like, even once I have, inshallah, been cured from the cancer, it's it's going to be something for the rest of my life I'm going to have to cope with. So it's it's scary. It's like one day my biggest stress is how am I going to get assignments done? And the next day it's like, wow, I have cancer, you know? So yeah. life, is, life is crazy, but, you know, Allah is the best of planners, so I'm... I just leave it up to him. Yeah, that's a good way to see it. But it's also understandable, like feeling up some days and down some days because it's a big thing. And like you only recently got diagnosed too. So like it's like the beginning. So, you know, obviously there's going to be so many different emotions hitting you all at once. Yeah. Um. So actually something I really have found that I'm struggling with is uh, I'm someone who usually bottles my emotions and I can handle it. But because this cancer is making me exhausted all the time. It's it's one of the symptoms. Um, actually, I'll say the symptoms if anyone doesn't know about Hodgkin's lymphoma. You have night sweats, so you're very dehydrated all the time. You get very dizzy and faint. You have an absolute loss of appetite. Um, you lose a lot of weight very quickly. I think I lost like about 15 kg in two months and I don't exercise. So many things and um, just made me really weak. So it's like the energy that I would put into bottling my emotions. I can't do it. Sometimes I just break out into tears and I saw something actually that was like I think it was last night my sister sent me this post on TikTok and it was saying that when you cry because you have cancer it's because you're grieving your old life because even once you're recovered it's never going to be the same and I think that's something that I'm struggling to come to terms with but um, I've become really um, in touch with Islam in the past I want to say two years so yeah. um, honestly, like maybe to people who aren't as religious um, or who, I don't know. I don't want to say who are as religious as me because I, I don't know much and I sin and all that kind of stuff. But I put everything in Allah's hands, every yeah. single thing. And I'm like, you know what, Allah will take care of me. I don't need to worry about it. And it's it's almost like this um, weight that's been lifted off your shoulders. So yeah, um, it's 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 a lot. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot. And I just want to thank you, like, for coming on, especially because it's so soon after being diagnosed. Like, you're being so vulnerable, and I really, really appreciate that. Because I can only imagine, like, finding out all of this and and having so many different life changes and the grieving as well. Like, it probably is really hard to talk about. So thank you for like being down to talk about it and kind of educate people on because I've always said this like you don't know how your life is going to be like you can be perfectly healthy one day and the next day you'll never be that healthy ever again and I think it's yeah. really important for people to realize that yeah um I don't know if everyone remembers but a couple of years ago there was this uh, man a Muslim man and he had cancer and he spoke about how Allah had blessed him with the cancer. And he was actually grateful. And um, because he was like, he had everything. He had the money, the cars, the houses. But it's like, the way I treat it is Allah has given me a test. It's almost like Allah has said to me that I want, you know, I, I've been saying before the cancer, I'm so faithful. I love Allah so much. Um, that kind of thing. And how can we know how strong our faith is unless it's tested? So this is all a test. And um, inshallah, my faith um, will remain strong and it hasn't wavered uh, I'm, I'm grateful that Allah gave me this opportunity to have my faith tested yeah yeah I, I I feel the same way like I know that what I have is not even close to being comparable to mm -hmm. cancer but I really relate to the whole like grieving your old life because 
for me, I I was born sickly. It's mm-hmm. a genetic thing for me as well. Like my Kala has it and then my Nani had it as well. Like and we they never labeled what they had. They yeah. just it was always referred to as like, oh, she's just weak. Like she's just really weak. Yeah. But like subhanAllah, like my Kala and my Nani, they were always able to fast. I remember when I was little, like I always was a lot slower and more tired than other kids. Like they were able to do things that I wasn't and my mom would just say oh it's okay like you're gonna grow up and be strong someday like it's okay like you'll grow up someday and I was like yeah like I'll grow up someday it's fine um but like we have a thing called PE testing I don't know if you guys have that too where like they basically like make you do like pull-ups push-ups like all these things and then they like rate you on them oh yeah we don't have that but I have heard of it okay yeah so I would always fail that I fail that every single year And I never understood why. And I never understood why it was so hard for me. And I could never run the mile. Like, I was always, like, dying, struggling. Like, I would... I would have to change my PE schedule because like if I have it a certain day like I wouldn't be able to focus on my classes the rest of the day and then like I would not do well in classes because I can't take notes because my fingers weren't strong enough to take notes and then like when we would go to Islamic classes at night like I couldn't sit on the floor like I would have to sit on a chair and then everyone would ask me why you want a chair you're so young but it was because like my knees would like really give me a lot of pain and so Mm -hmm. I couldn't sit down on the floor like I couldn't sit crisscross applesauce like how they make little kids sit you know like I couldn't do it and it's been like that my whole life and then in 2018 I was on a medicine for only a week and I don't want to say medicine because I know but I was on a medicine for for my acne it was literally just for my acne that's all it was seven days and I was in the hospital after that because apparently it like my body had some really bad reaction to it and I was dehydrated I had to have IVs and I was like fainting all the time and then that entire year so 2018 it was the beginning of 20 no it was the beginning of 2019 sorry and then all of 2019 I was in and out of the doctor's office fainting all the time I I basically I was always weak but I went from being able-bodied to disabled like overnight pretty much and it wasn't until the end of 2019 I met a Muslim girl her name was Sephora and Mm -hmm. she had cancer yeah I don't know what kind of cancer she had but she had stage four Mm -hmm. I think it was I don't remember the name it was really rare that's why I don't remember the name because it was like a really rare form of cancer that like didn't have many treatments yeah and unfortunately she did pass away at the end of 2019 yeah Um, but we connected because I was like always talking like I would ask people for help online like I'd be like please like does anyone have any answers like I don't know what's happening to me like I don't want to live like this like please help me and she kind of helped me come to terms with being comfortable with the term disabled and that's when I began grieving my old life because I realized Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna grow up you know like how my mom would say you're gonna grow up someday I don't get that and I was never able to fast ever because my mom would say like I would want to right because I'd see everyone else around me fasting and I'd be like mommy like can I fast this year and she'd be like no you're too little like and I'd be like 16 she'd be like you're too little like (laughs) You'll grow up someday and you can fast. And I think it's because she always knew that my body couldn't handle it because I also have, I have disordered eating. I have ARFID, which is avoidant slash restrictive food intake disorder. Um, So I've always been malnourished and it's very obvious that I'm malnourished. <laughs> So I've always been really malnourished. And so I think that's also why she was like, no, no, no. And then obviously, mm-hmm. once I became disabled, like it was not a possibility for me because after I became disabled, I had to get on a really strict schedule. So my eating is very strict. And if uh-huh. I skip that even by like 30 minutes, it's not good. Like it's real bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've never been able to fast. But have you have you fasted before? Yeah, I started fasting when I was about, I think I must have been about seven Mm -hmm. and um, my school was really accommodating to Muslim students so instead of having to sit in the canteen or run in the playground there was a room where Muslim students could sit with a Muslim teacher you could talk about Islam or you could even nap which a lot of us did Um, nice nice and I've been fasting all my life um I went through this phase where I, I'll be honest, um, and I'm I, I'm deeply regretful of it, but I wasn't as in touch with my faith as I used to be. So mm-hmm. I would pretend to fast in front of my family. I would wake up and eat with them. But then, like, when I would go to college, um, by the way, when I say college, I don't mean American college. I mean, like, uh-huh. ages yeah. of uh, 16 to 18. Uh, I would just go into college and I would eat. And if anyone asked me, like, 
why are you fasting? I would just say like, oh, I'm on my period or, oh, I have a headache. And I would make excuses. But um, like I said, the past few years, um, I've gotten in touch with my religion more. And I've been really excited about um, fasting. Uh, I will say for about, I want to say not last year, but the three years before that, um, I suffer from PCOS and it got really bad. So sorry to be TMI, but I was on my period every single day for three years. Oh, wow. and, yeah. And the worst thing is it wasn't even like it was a lot, but it was happening every day. I was wasting money and I was exhausted all the time. And all the doctors really said is you can take birth control. But my mom is really against it because it messed her body up a lot. Yeah. And I didn't want to mess with anything so I just suffered like that and I couldn't fast but um, I've changed my diet a lot and last year I was able to fast I was really looking forward to fasting this year but um, yeah. this is the first year I've not been able to I would say yeah and you know what's crazy is that medicine that disabled me actually was birth control <gasps> wow it's yeah. it's it's so crazy because my mom said that birth control was like one of the worst things that she did and she didn't take it for those reasons she took it for health related reasons they said to her like I don't know what problem she had but they said if you take birth control it will be really good for you and um I've just heard not many good experiences I'm not trying to preach but for me personally I didn't want to do it um but my diet has sorted it out so at least that's not a problem for me anymore yeah alhamdulillah for that definitely but yeah I'm not gonna lie I tell everyone I'm like you need to not don't do not take birth control like it <laughs> don't know what could happen and honestly it's really like I did it for my acne and guess what I still have acne and <laughs> now I'm disabled like it really was not worth it and I feel so stupid for why did I do that it feels like whenever there's like a simple problem for women the healthcare industry is just like have have birth control but like for problems for men they have such specific medication I wish oh. that was more there for women yeah same it's really unfair and it's really messed up yeah I fully agree um I actually had a question for you um so like one thing that I've been struggling with a lot is obviously like I mentioned I get upset quite a bit and I have days where I cry and I need to do it otherwise my body holds on to it um mm -hmm. and I have people saying to me um these are people I love like my friends and family mm -hmm. look Iram you need to be strong um, don't cry and that really is starting to bother me because I feel like well I am being strong and in my opinion I'm still going to university I'm still working I'm getting my assignments done I'm trying to continue with life as normal as I can but mm -hmm. when I'm told like oh don't cry you need to be strong it makes me feel like my efforts are weak have you ever had anyone when you've been struggling like kind of trying to encourage you and say be strong or why well, you've got this oh when yeah and I go off on them every time because <laughs> it, it, it is annoying and it's like you're the one going through it you're the one whose life is being affected by it every single day like you are never I mean it, it sounds awful but it's true like we are never going to have our prime days ever again like that mm -hmm. is the truth and it's really easy for these people like anyone to say be strong like yada yada because they haven't experienced this they haven't mm -hmm. had to lose and like I'm the same as you where like I'm now very grateful for my disabilities because I do think that that's God forgiving a lot of my sins and I'm grateful for that now, but like that doesn't make this the easiest thing in the world because it's still really hard. Like it's hard to function every day and, and you are going to school and working and all that still on top of this. So it's like, you are strong, but why do women always have to be strong? Why do women, anytime we show any sort of emotion, it's like, oh, be strong, but it's like you're diminishing any other thing that you're actually doing. And it, it just honestly just go off on them just yell at them be like you're not the one with cancer like you need to stop like if I want to cry about it I'm going to cry about it like this is my pity party like you're allowed to have pity parties and I tell I tell people that all the time I'm like I'm having a pity party right now you can either come to my party and support me or you can leave and that's up to you but my pity party will end eventually and I know that but I'm allowed yeah. to have one every once in a while yeah because otherwise you end up bottling things up and for me I've I've been hearing it for about two weeks and eventually last night I was like look I am being strong um even like yesterday I had to get an assignment done I had like like 2k words to complete by midnight and my body was sore 
it was aching everywhere and I was just really struggling but I was like I need to get out of bed I need to work on this assignment and I need to feed myself and make sure that everything is okay and or like even today all I really had to do is do the laundry and that took it out of me and I was like trying to push through it's so hard but eventually we need to cry because we're human and we have emotions I, I don't want to be a robot and you and you shouldn't have to be a robot and it's sad that they expect you to be yeah because I will admit at the beginning um of my diagnosis I used to cry privately but in front of everyone I was very um I used to bottle things up but my mental health was struggling a lot. Um, and I don't want to get back to that place. I know I'll have days that are really horrible, but at the end of the day, we need to experience them. And I just pray to Allah every single time and it helps me. So um, I kind of don't mind the tears. It's it's cathartic. It is. And it's really, it's really healthy. And I wish that the Daisy community specifically like understood that because I've always felt like I wasn't allowed to cry. Mm. And like, I felt like growing up, like, and I know my mom, my mom's really like understanding and sweet. Alhamdulillah, like I'm very grateful for that. Like she's, she's way more understanding about mental health than majority of Desi parents that I've seen. But like, I know whenever I'd cry growing up, like she'd always ask me like, why are you crying? And I always felt interrogated. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like, and so I stopped crying eventually because I was like, I don't like being interrogated. But like, I knew she was, she was asking these questions because she wanted to find a solution. But like, sometimes you don't want a solution. Sometimes you just want to cry. Yeah. And it's it's so healthy to cry. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point. And I wish that in our Desi community, we would accept the fact that women can cry and we can be sensitive and we can even be angry. And it's completely okay. We are human. And it's like we're expected to be that kind of perfect, polite, sweet lady who's got a smile on her face all the time. And that's just not possible. We need to allow our Muslim sisters to feel their emotions and have someone to go to when they're upset because otherwise you just have a depressed community who have no one to turn to and I know that there was a really difficult part in my life um, or what I told you about my past um, engagement and how I fell into suicidal thoughts and I felt like I had no one to turn to and I contemplated ending my life and now I'm in a place, alhamdulillah, where I have so many people around me who encourage me to feel my emotions. Um, I think they understand now that if I want to cry about the cancer, I will. <laughs> but um, It's your right. You have the right to cry about it. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I completely... I completely agree with you. Have you have you ever gotten any kind of like backlash for not fasting? Oh, I'm really yeah, curious. Definitely. So I actually don't post Ramadan vlogs anymore. I don't know if you I can't remember how long you followed me, but the first year I got married, I posted a Ramadan vlog every single day. And like I'm I'm a very honest vlogger. Like I don't vlog like other people do. Like I show every little bit of my day. Like I don't hmm. I don't play it up for the camera. And so obviously like I'm showing myself like having snacks and whatever. And I am i don't wake up for Sahri with a waist because why would I? Like I'm not fasting. Why would I, why would I disturb my own sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. But also like people don't understand that like I have to be on a very strict sleep schedule. Otherwise I'm unwell the next day and they don't understand that. But um, yeah, I got a lot of hate. I got so much hate. And so... That's why I was like, I'm not doing Ramadan vlogs again. Like, and, but even before the internet, like I, I, I don't think my mom, like I, I, I know my mom always means well, she has very good intentions behind everything that she does, mm -hmm. but like, she would always tell me like, don't eat in public. Like, don't tell people you're not fasting. Like just yeah. pretend like you're fasting. Like, cause of my picky eating, I, I often don't eat at Davids. Um, mm -hmm. and sorry food honestly doesn't appeal to me I don't like fried food like that so yeah. like I would go and I wouldn't eat anything and people would be like oh she's not eating wasn't she fasting like and make all these comments and so sometimes I just wouldn't attend or I would like have to like pick food or, or something like that and so I, I've never gotten anything in real life because I've always had to kind of pretend that I was fasting or like not be caught 
eating or whatever and I mean thankfully there's not a large Muslim um, population where I live so like I could go to school casually and just eat and no one's gonna ask me anything because a lot of Americans don't even know um what Ramadan is or fasting is so it was fine but like the first time I was like exposed to the Muslim community online like it was really bad and then even now like I'm glad that I post my vlogs not in real time because I know if I mention that I'm not fasting and I'm showing my snack time like I know people are going to get really aggressive about it and like leave comments and just be really unkind. It's really unfair. Um, So like it kind of because I, I, I used to follow you back then and I remember people commenting and saying to you that you should fast, you're able to. And they used to bring up their own experiences and how they fasted despite what they were going through. And so I remember that. And um, I have a toxic extended family. Um, some who I know have seen your content before. So uh, hey, cousins, if you're listening to this, now you know I have cancer. <laughs> but I've hidden it from them for the sole reason that they will judge me. Um, and they will say horrible comments to me. I, I, I know it for a fact. Um, so the people who I've told about my cancer are people who I really trust, or mm. if I feel like I'm able to be anonymous to a certain point, uh, I, I will speak about it then. But it's just, it's just really sad, because when I was doing my research about it, I had just been newly diagnosed, because I was diagnosed the the Friday before Ramadan started. Um, yeah. So I was doing some research on, on the day I found out. And a lot of people were saying, no, you shouldn't fast. Um, and some people were saying, well, fasting is actually good, because there's a lot of like, health benefits to fasting when you have cancer. But I've been struggling, I'd say, since January. Um, I've been really weak. I've been fainting a lot. I had to take iron tablets, but it got to a certain point where they didn't even work anymore. Um, and I couldn't even, like, walk to the bathroom. Um, and I live in university accommodation, so my bathroom is is like an ensuite. I can't even walk a few steps without feeling dizzy or faint. And all of my family were like, look, you need to build your strength up again. So I decided to do that. But it's, it's kind of upsetting to see a lot of people online um, who just who haven't been through what I've been through or what I'm going through. And they just demand that everyone should fast. Um, I wish I could fast. It breaks my heart that I'm not fasting. And um, my... Um, my fiance has uh is like a is a revert and he's been fasting for a couple of years and it's just really sad because it's like I want to take part in like iftars with him and stuff but I can't do it and um oh I I, I don't know I, it doesn't feel like Ramadan for me this year and maybe that's because I'm not living with my family but also I've not been living with my family for the past three years while I've been at university um I just feel like I'm really distant from Ramadan this year and I'm trying my hardest to do things like read the Quran, um, listen to surahs to calm me down, uh, pray a lot um, and I'm trying to build the strength to read namaz because the, the sudden movements make me really dizzy. Um, mm. So I've been trying to build my strength up but I just wish people were more forgiving. I feel like Ramadan is a time where we should really purify ourselves and kind of unrelated but I feel like this year the um, Muslim Twitter TikTok has become so toxic every single day there's you know a new topic where people are being hateful and it's just not the kind of environment you want to be around yeah definitely and honestly I think it's a good idea that you didn't fast this year especially like because you were as dizzy as you are like it, it doesn't sound like fasting would you know be good on your health right now I I, yeah. I mean who knows inshallah maybe someday you can get to a point where fasting would be okay for you but yeah. it would be okay if that day never came too and like people need to understand that because they need to understand that n not every health issue looks the same either like everyone's health issues manifest in a different manner depending on their body their other underlying health issues like other genetic factors like it's very very different and it I agree like talk uh Twitter TikTok Instagram like it's gotten really toxic as time goes by which I think is so sad yeah but I mean it's sad that we have to you know 
hide things. But that actually brings me to my next question, which was, how did you feel to be around others who were fasting? Like, did you feel left out? And I know you mentioned that, like, it doesn't feel like Ramadan this year. So do you want to, like, elaborate on that a little? Yeah, so my university has um, an Islamic society and it has a Palestine society, which I joined. And they held, like, iftars where you can join. But I just felt really guilty going because I was like, I'll be eating free food that when I've not been fasting and other people haven't been fasting, I'm taking food that, you know, someone who's actually been fasting has done. And and then when, like, there was a time where I went out for iftar, um, it's when I went with my fiancé and he was fasting and he got some water from the restaurant and he was waiting and I was really thirsty, but I didn't want to drink my water because I thought I'd be judged. And it just made me feel like, like I'm not, Muslim enough and I really struggled with it but whereas now I've kind of come to terms with the fact that if I do try to fast it's going to be hard on my body but I, I do feel left out and I feel like I feel guilty I feel like people might not perceive me as Muslim or part of the community it, I feel really alienated and it's why I I really appreciated having you because I can talk to someone who's like you know on the other side of the world Sorry, I don't know geography, but you know, you're not you're not in England. And yeah. um someone who completely relates to that feeling of not fasting, um, it's really nice because I wish people a, a lot of people see Ramadan, I feel like, as a punishment and yeah. they feel like, oh, I have to fast or whatever, but it's a blessing and, and I really wish I could do it. Uh I wish there were communities for people who don't fast and they can still do like Islamic activities together, read the Quran together. I think it would be really nice, but something like that doesn't exist. Yeah, At least not I'd, I'd love to create something like that, but I think it'd be so hard. I, I feel like it'd be easier in England because there's so many Muslims where like communities could kind of yeah. form their own little groups. But yeah, I don't think, no offense, no one cancel me, please. But like, <laughs> the Muslims in England are so rigid. Is that the word I want to use? I don't know. <laughs> like, they, I feel like they're the type of people to be disabled, but gaslight themselves that they're not disabled just because, like, they're above it or whatever. So, like, I don't think that any of them would actually come out and admit that they would benefit from having a community filled with other people who also can't fast. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so right. As someone who's lived in a Muslim community, like, all my life I'd say until I was 23 years old um it's it's very true they are very stuck in their ways and I think a lot of people even if they needed help would um just to appease the community and for appearances sake they would force themselves to fast even if they would really really struggle and I don't think that's a good idea um you know Allah is not trying to punish us and Allah has given us these exceptions um, like reasons why you can't fast and I just think that this kind of punishing behavior is it's making our religion look really harsh when it isn't it's so beautiful and yeah I, I could speak about UK Muslims all day to be honest so let me not even start <laughs> be another podcast episode but yeah I totally agree and you know I I think that I understand where that guilt that you feel attending iftaris comes from mm -hmm. and it's easier said than done but definitely try and remember like you deserve to eat as well and feeding someone with a health condition is also like really like you get benefits for in Islam so like it's not like you're not fasting for funds and then going and like taking this food like you are a person who has cancer who also deserves to eat and I think that because for me personally like I also feel really left out like I grew up in a very like practicing family so like everyone around me was always fasting like my brother also started fasting at a really young age mm -hmm. and so growing up around it like I always felt left out like that's why I was was like can I fast can I fast like I really want to fast and then it really hurt me to find out that like I can never fast that's not something that will ever be feasible for me and it does suck but I still really enjoy going to iftaris like I love getting my little outfits on and even though I I definitely eat before I go I'm not gonna lie because my eating time like ends at seven and if thought here is like 7 15 ish mm -hmm. so like I eat before I go but like I still really like to go and like feel the vibes and 
it's really nice and and even if I wanted to go there and eat like I I we deserve a spot at the table like we are Muslims as well and it's not like we're not fasting for fun so we definitely deserve to go and have a good time and feel as much vibes as we can because it can be really really isolating yeah Ramadan is always been a time of year that I look forward to and um especially like seeing the person I'm going to marry who when he can when he reverted he was like oh I'm looking forward to fasting and I wanted to kind of encourage him but I felt like a fraud but you're completely right just because of my cancer or because of anyone's health issues it doesn't mean that you're not a Muslim um and I find that there are other ways that we can show our dedication and um, strengthen our faith. Um, you can read the Quran or you can listen to lectures and talks and um, still try to get yourself in the spirit, I think is good. But yeah, I'm definitely going to take your advice and go to one of these um, iftaris because I really miss them. And I really regret not going to the ones that I've missed. Yeah, and it'd probably be really good for your mental health too. Like to feel like not like because you're already having so many changes in your life. Like mm. you deserve to have at least some sort of stability that you know isn't going to change. Yeah, definitely. Um, and inshallah, based on my treatment, uh, the way the schedule looks for it, I should inshallah be cured by the time next Ramadan comes around. So some people choose to fast, some people kind of wait, um, but I kind of thought that I'm going to try fi- uh, to fast on Laylat al-Qadr, the night of pow- power, and I'm going to try and pray. But if it's really hard and taxing on me, I'm, I'm not going to keep the fast. But at the moment, I'm going to try to just because, I don't know, I, I want to see if I can. I've been mm. building my strength up, but um, I don't know, we'll see if I can do it. <laughs> Fingers crossed, I can. But I'm not going to force myself. It's Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, I feel that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that reminds me, like, one thing that I really, really struggle with is Fajr. I can't do oh, it. Yeah. Oh, I've tried. I'm trying to adjust my schedule. But, like, because I'm on such, like, a strict schedule. And I've been on this schedule since... 2019 so it's like really hard to change it right so I'm like moving it by like 20 minutes like once I adjust I've yeah. moved and I'm up to waking up at 8 30 now which is a significant change because I used to wake up at like 11 yeah like I'm trying to work my way up to always waking up at fudger time yeah but like people don't get that like they really think that it is so easy to just wake up pray namaz and then go back to sleep like they don't understand how truly and I know that it's not supposed to be easy right like yeah it's 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 always going to be a test and it's always going to be hard but like it is not feasible for me to wake up for fudger every morning and then be disabled the rest of the day like it's just not something that I can do and I wish I could but I can't do it why I don't wake up for Sahri either because it's like I will be so unwell yeah I I feel like there's a lot of judgment and a lot of people who kind of have this superiority complex about waking up at Fajr and don't get me wrong if you wake up at Fajr every morning you are so blessed and alhamdulillah that's amazing but some of us really struggle like I mean I know in my case I struggle to get out of bed um, pretty much every day and if I don't have um, it used to be seven hours of sleep it's now 10 hours of sleep if I don't have those hours I just can't function in the day to the point where I can't even walk. And my intention is there. But I just think that we should kind of operate with kindness and compassion because, you know, we should be following the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he was so compassionate. He was so kind. He was so understanding. And he would not have been the type of prophet who would have judged people or ridiculed people um, for being unable to do things. He would probably pray for them or ask them to pray for strength or, um, I don't know, find ways to work around it. But he would not shame people. And I just wish, like, if, if I had one like thing that I want people to take away from this, I just really wish the Muslim community everywhere, uh, especially the Desi community, though, um, had a lot of compassion because 
our religion is already stigmatized. People already think that we are crazy and strict and, you know, that we are oppressed. But we really aren't. We are so blessed and our religion is so beautiful and loving. And yeah. we need to portray that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I yeah. think that the stereotype is already there and it's sad that and I don't know why people get really mad when we say this like they I don't know I've seen people get really aggressive about it but like I do feel like a lot of Muslims and I'm sorry but especially UK Muslims I feel like they they make it really easy to believe the stereotypes and yeah. I think that's sad and there was something else I was gonna say and I completely forgot oh that's so annoying oh yeah I remember um, I think that a lot of them also like they ridicule people under the guise of like advice or yeah. advice and that really bothers me because like and that's why I don't ever give anyone advice like I know that people say like oh no as a Muslim like you should be advising people I disagree and I'm sorry if that makes me a bad person or whatever like I from what I've observed, like when people aren't doing something that they should be doing or like they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, like there's already a good part of them that feels guilty about it. Yeah. And me saying something is not going to most likely not going to change their behavior. It's just going to make them feel even worse about it. And yeah. I really feel like it's between them and God because like I feel bad enough for not being able to wake up for Fudger. Like and behind the scenes, like the people like always can see that. I'm really trying like I'm trying to make adjustments to my schedule that way it's something that I can do but then other people are going to be like oh do you pray Fajr no oh well you're a bad Muslim and it's like okay like but I already feel bad about it and I already am trying my best to make it work like and they also I really just don't even understand like God is rewarding us for our intent like we are making those small changes towards like a good change and it's like that counts for something and they act like it counts for nothing. And that's why I don't believe in advising people. I just don't believe in it. I will always disagree with it. I yeah. think if someone is doing something that really upsets you that much, because I'm not going to lie, there are some things that people do that are a sin that really, really upset me. Yeah. And it only upsets me because it's like, I feel like they're influencing people the wrong way. That's the only reason why it upsets me. It never yeah. upsets me because I, I never feel any control over their lives. It's just like, I wish you weren't influencing other people. Yeah. But I never comment that. I just block them. That way I'm not judging them. Like that's, and yeah. then I call it a day. And I really feel like people need to just do that. Yeah, it's it's such a problem, especially in the UK Muslim community. Um, before anyone gets triggered, you know it's true. Um, you don't want a mirror to be held up to you. You might want to hate on Orwa saying it because you're like, oh, she's American. She doesn't get it. Well, I'm a UK Muslim. I've lived in a UK Muslim community all my life. And it's true. We need to admit it. Why do we feel like we need to ridicule people or look down on them because we feel like they are sinning? Does that make us feel better? Like, for example, you might see a girl who, in your opinion, isn't dre dressing modestly or dressing the way the Quran says we should dress. Um and leave horrible comments on her posts but what are you doing that's productive she probably is aware of the fact that she's not dressing modestly and yeah. she may be struggling with that herself and i just think that we need to, like people will do that and they'll they'll judge people and leave horrible comments and they'll say oh well you know that's my good deed of the day done because i've been advising someone I know so many people in my extended family, you guys know who you are, um, <laughs> who have completely judged me for the way I am. They judge me for being with a revert. They judge me because um, my parents are no longer together. They judge me because um, so many other reasons that they think make me a bad person. But then they are hateful. Um, they gossip about people they they just do horrible horrible things to make people feel horrible about themselves and how can you feel okay with yourself like how can you go to sleep at night and think oh i'm i'm in the right i really really wish that the uk muslim community has a huge wake up call because um it's like people are talking about this suhoor fest they are judging girls for wearing abayas instead of like shalwar kameez they are judging girls for going to have seri outside 
um there's like it's like every single day there's some hateful discourse that people are talking about and it's like instead of doing this if you are truly focused on your dean you would delete these apps i've deleted twitter i almost never go on tiktok i spend my time trying to enrich myself and if you can't even speak pure words and try to be a better person in ramadan when are you going to do it we have this one month Let's not waste it and let's not waste our time on earth by being horrible people. Because you might think that your little comments is an advice, but you're coming from a place of hatred. Um, yeah. People who leave comments um, ju judging Urwa and you think you're doing it for Islamic guidance, you're not coming from a place of love because like, you can DM Urwa and she will reply. Um, but you're commenting hateful things because you want her to feel bad. Yeah. And try to really think about your intentions and think, is this sin that I want to be written and recorded on the Day of Judgment? Please think about that, guys. It's I don't think a lot of us are scared of the Day of Judgment and we really, really need to be. I agree. It's, yeah. It, it, I really don't think that they, like, you're, you, we're going to have to stand in front of God and defend what we did, like, and they're going to be, like, quaking in their boots, and they don't understand that, like, they're so confident with it now, and I agree with, like, the, like, this month, we are supposed, like, people don't understand the true meaning behind fasting, like, you're not just not eating, like, you're teaching yourself discipline, you're teaching, your, you're, like, you're reevaluating what is important and what isn't important, you're learning gratitude and patience and self-regulation and I don't think that people actually bother ever learning any of that I think they fast just to fast and and it's also sad that like like okay this is like a minuscule thing but it's something that like I think about a lot is like people give up coffee during the Ramadan right yeah but then the second that Ramadan is over they're back on their coffee and yeah. it's like even and I think that the boycotting is what made me realize this is yeah. like we are supposed to fight addiction in any area like mm -hmm. if you are addicted to coffee that is something that as a muslim we need to reevaluate like we because like even with my my coke addiction which yeah. i struggled with for like over 20 years and i just yeah. gave up recently because i had no one come for me i had two big cases that i bought before october 7th and then i was just like finishing it off but I finished it off like about a month ago and it was really hard, but I'm glad that I did it because ultimately do I want to be a day like fighting that teaching ourselves discipline. And I think it's sad that people will quote unquote behave for a month and then go right back to where they were. And it's like, did you learn nothing? Yeah. It's like, if, if my, if my cancer has taught me anything, it's that this world does not matter. The only thing that matters is Allah and trying to be a good Muslim and trying to be a good person. And if you are a good Muslim, you will be a good person. These material things, um, commenting on things online that have no relation to you, it's just not important. I was someone who was so heavily influenced by celebrity gossip. I used to read all the news articles, I used to like read all these forums talking about YouTubers who I didn't really care about, but I would just read gossip pages about them. And I was, it's not like I was adding anything to it, but it was all this meaningless worldly stuff that doesn't matter. I cared so much about getting the perfect Instagram photo. I wanted to do, curate this image of myself for people to see. But when you have an illness or something that affects your life and your health like for the rest of your life you really reevaluate things and it really makes you remember so um it's it's gonna sound like i'm it's gonna sound like Urwa's asked me to like <laughs> come for everyone who comes for her she hasn't um but people who are questioning her intentions and her like journey of getting closer to Islam don't question it we should be supporting people who are getting closer and I'll admit I've gotten even closer to religion because of what's happened to me we should support people and we shouldn't care about all these worldly worldly things because once we're dead your Instagram posts TikToks uh impressing random people online that's not gonna matter your yeah. sins your good deeds that's all that's gonna matter mm -hmm. yeah i fully agree and thank you for that i appreciate you um <laughs> <Me too. laughs> okay i i still have a few more questions um i know that this ramadan is 
your first one not fat well since you are unable to fast like this is your first ramadan that you're unable to fast sorry i don't know why i stumbled over wording that but um <laughs> the question is does ramadan make you feel happy or anxious um i would say when i'm on my own it makes me feel happy but mm -hmm. if i'm around other muslims in public i do feel anxious yeah. like if i i'm just scared that they're gonna think badly of me because um if i need to drink water because i'm dehydrated or I, or i need to have like a cereal bar because I'm feeling really dizzy. I'm scared that people are going to think badly of me. I'm scared that people are going to judge me or think that I'm, you know, not interested in my religion or I'm not wanting, that I'm not a practicing Muslim. Um, so I think I'm definitely anxious when I'm around other Muslims. But yeah. when I'm on my own, uh, I do feel happy about it. That's good. Yeah, I'd say I feel the same. I think that I always look forward to the iftaris and all that. I find that really fun. And I always try to implement one good habit every Ramadan, like stick to it the entire year. And, yeah. and so I look forward to that. But I think since becoming a public figure, I've noticed that when people ask me like, oh, are you excited for Ramadan? My answer is usually no. Yeah. Um, because I am filled with so much anxiety yeah. um, because I'm and but also I think that ever since I don't live with my family anymore and this I believe this is our third Ramadan together me and Wais yeah. um but he's never home because he's working in in school so I'm usually home all alone and so it's just me in my yeah. own little world and so I often forget that people are fasting yeah um, and so I will post like my little food or whatever um and I have found that people get really upset by that <laughs> Do so, people like I, sorry no you're fine um i i just meant it i was going to ask like obviously you've not been able to fast all your life and you must have family friends or, or just family who who are aware of the fact that you don't fast um are they like understanding of it or do you hide it from my knowledge my family is understanding of it like my extended family and all that and i don't have many friends um i'm very picky with who i befriend yeah. but my friends all, they're great. They all understand. But um, my extended family, yeah, alhamdulillah, I, I have never had to hide it. But they also don't live with me. So uh, I don't know if they, I don't know if it's ever been really spoken about. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't even think that a lot of them know that I have an eating disorder. Yeah. Because I don't see them enough because they live like an hour away. So I don't see them enough. But I do know that when I go to their house, I always have to eat something on the way back home because I never eat there because they, I don't like I don't like the food and that's yeah. not me saying that they don't make great food I'm sure they do it looks great but I never eat it and I've noticed that typically it's the people who know I have disordered eating that'll go out of their way to accommodate it like my grandpa lives in the city um he's my great uncle technically but I call him my grandpa but um and his kids my I call them my kalas but they're my mom's cousins um mm -hmm. they all know that I have disordered eating and they've always like gone the extra mile to order me food so I know oh. that if I ate or drank around them like they're not gonna they know they know yeah. I have health and all that but alhamdulillah yeah. you are looking to have a supportive family though yeah I, I really am and I think I realized that recently too because I went to an iftari at my friend's house for her birthday um yeah. and I only went because like it wasn't a it wasn't a birthday bash it was literally just like a, we're just gonna have iftari that's it yeah. and um her mom ordered what she wanted and not what her daughter wanted yeah. and I was like oh that's crazy like not everyone has parents that are going to accommodate your eating and I think that's the first time I was really exposed to it yeah. and that made it click in my head like I am so lucky that my mom never forced me to fast like my dad never gave me you know side eye for not fasting like I've heard girls have to pretend they're fasting when they're on their periods around their dad and like because their dad's like you can't even have that conversation yet my dad I mean I think I really think it's because he was raised American because he's yeah. been here was like he wasn't even teenage years like he before teenage years so he he's more american than anything but he's always made sure i'm fed like the other day he drove me and my sister to get ice cream like <laughs> she was on her period and I, i'm not fasting so he drove us to take ice cream and he paid for it like and he, it was never a matter of like oh don't eat in front of me like yada yada like like we're always like dad can you buy us this and he's like yeah like he'll take us and he'll just not eat and it's fine and we never felt like we had to hide it because and I feel like that's really important like you shouldn't have to especially when you're a girl dad like bro you gotta get used to them eating in front of you like 
they are yeah. gonna be they need to be fed like yeah uh, have to, we're so lucky. yeah and then my mom as well like she always would ask us what we wanted to eat and so I was able to get what I wanted without like starving because with my eating disorder is like I know I know that kids without this eating disorder it's been proven that if you keep exposing them to foods they'll eventually eat it yeah kids with my disorder I would I will I will starve myself I will yeah. starve I absolutely will start. I have starved myself. Like, because I will do that over eating that food. I, I yeah. simply will not eat it. And so I'm very grateful that my mom wasn't one of those daisy parents that was like, oh, you don't want to eat it? Starve then. Like, she was very accommodating. And I am so, so grateful for that because I don't know what I would have done without that. And I will say, yeah, I think a majority of my family, they've never given me anything for it. They, I haven't heard from my mom that they've said anything about it. So I think that they've been, they've been very understanding and, kind about it yeah alhamdulillah that's that's amazing because the struggles we go through it's it's made so much easier with the support of our families yeah I will say though I'm not that close to a lot of my cousins I, to, to be fair I only have two first cousins I don't have a lot of first cousins but yeah. my second cousins I consider like my cousins I don't I'm not very close to a lot of them and I do get vibes from a few of them like Hater yeah. vibes, <laughs> but like a lot of them are also young, so I'm not counting those. But the ones that are like my age or above, I get hater vibes from a few of them. So I'm certain that they might have something to say, but I also don't think that they'd say anything about my not fasting because American Muslims are whitewashed. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, I if your cousins were UK Muslims, they would have so much to say. Yeah, I don't deal with the. Also, a lot of my family assimilated early on, like a lot of. Um, like the parents generation have been in America for a really long time yeah. um, the ones that moved later on I have noticed have a lot more closed-minded mindsets yeah so very similar to UK vibe but majority <laughs> of them are very relaxed understanding like I've never dealt with like the snaky cousin like I've never dealt with Actually, I think people think I'm the snaky cousin because out of all the cousins, me and me and my sister are the most like cultural. Um, yeah. So they think I'm the snaky cousin, which is funny because like I'm not. But <laughs> yeah, everyone's pretty like there, there's some that are more whitewashed, some that are more religious, but like everyone's pretty much assimilated. So I don't think anyone's judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. My Thank cousin. God. <laughs> my cousins are like I have so many first cousins so honestly I don't talk to any of them and uh I kind of know how they feel about me and me and my siblings are kind of seen as like the black sheep of the family um but I don't care we're the only ones who have been university educated we're the only girls who have been university educated um we're the only ones who haven't had arranged marriages. Um, when I get married and when my sister gets married, it's to a revert, which hasn't, it's not been done in our family. Um, and it's to non desi reverts. Um, so that's another thing. And they don't like the fact that although my mom, my mom came here when she was six months old and my dad came here when he was about 23 or 24. Um, he came over with my mom once they got married. Um, even though my cousin's parents are from the exact same generation, my parents are really open-minded. They, alhamdulillah, are so supportive. And uh, I've, I've literally heard that one of my cousins, um, biggest op in the world, <laughs> has, has literally said, why is Iram allowed to live her life the way she wants to, um, but I'm not allowed to live the way that I want to? And alhamdulillah, she's so blessed. She's married. She has a home. She has a beautiful baby. But she's just really resentful of the fact that her parents always controlled her. But my parents gave me that freedom to live out my dreams and have education. And um, sorry, like, sorry, I've been blessed with amazing parents who support me. What do you want me to do? Well, yeah, it makes no sense to resent you for that. Like, I, yeah. I've noticed that with a lot of closed minded individuals, I feel bad I'm like shitting on UK Muslims. So I'm just gonna say closed minded individuals. But like, <laughs> I've noticed that they like they'll lack something and they'll project on whoever has it. And yeah. I don't understand that. Like, why don't you resent your parents instead? Like, they're the ones who did it. Like, what? what do you gain from being cruel to someone else yeah exactly like an issue that with with one of my cousins who she was like a sister to me at one point and she all her life was like I'm never getting married to someone from Pakistan I'm never getting married to someone who is like living in Pakistan especially and she had this weird like fetish for black men and she ended up getting married to someone from Pakistan um and when she found out 
that my fiance is Filipino. She got so angry about it and she actually had a full argument with her parents saying it's not fair when I wanted to marry a black man you guys didn't support me but Iram's allowed to marry a Filipino and everyone supports her and I'm like it's it's how is it my fault how is it my parents fault like my parents number one thing has always been he needs to be a Muslim he needs to be caring and he needs to bring you closer to Islam but she has that's the most important thing why does anything else matter yeah that is so strange also <laughs> I find it really funny how many of my UK friends tell me that they have cousins that like are haters like yeah I don't I've even had people tell me that their cousins leave hate comments on my videos, which I just, I find it so funny. <laughs> my cousins. Sad. It's, a little, it's sad. And I'm sorry. It's, it's so funny you say that because my cousins have, um, they showed me one of your videos. It's when you had recently gotten married and they were trying to like make a joke about you. And I was like, she looks beautiful. Cause they were saying about the fact that you were wearing glasses. And I was like, I'm going to wear my glasses. I can't wear contact lenses. Yeah, they don't use on my eyes. She's a yeah. trail, she's a trailblazer. Like who cares? I really and the funniest part is like when I came England, like all these people like are staring at me, right? And they're like whispering about me. And like I'm very like perceptive about my surroundings. Yeah. And so like I know they're talking about me. And so like I'd wave and <laughs> they would like they'd start like whispering aggressively and start fast walking away. And I'm like, oh, where's the hate comment now? Like, yeah, just say something in person. That. I'd love, I'd love for you to say something. And then people were taking pictures of me and I was taking pictures in the back. So <laughs> Yeah, it's the best way to deal with it. Yeah, and then they were, like, mad at me. They were like, she's so weird. Like, why does she wave at everyone? Um, It's called being friendly. And also, like, if you're taking pictures and staring and whispering at someone, like, do you want them to be quiet about it and pretend they don't notice you? Like, they just they are just embarrassed that they got caught and they feel humiliated. That's all it is. That's real. Uh, it, it, it was, there, there, there was this one girl in London. Yeah. And I was like, walking and she was with some guy I don't know who he was maybe her brother I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt it was her brother um and she's walking with this guy and she like sees me and I and I hear TikTok I also have very good hearing so like I heard her say TikTok and so because like obviously I, I get stares a lot so I'm not gonna assume that every person that stares at me knows me from TikTok okay like I they stare at me and I'm like mm, what kind of stare is this and then I heard her say TikTok and I was like, oh, that's what it is. Okay. And then I waved. And she like looked away and started like whispering frantically. And then he waved back at me. And then they they like ran away. And I was like, what was that? Like, you're a grown adult. It's so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. I would never do that. Well, do you Muslims, your haters. Let's just be honest. Sorry if this sorry if this is controversial, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they're gonna recognize me next time. But anyways, that's not the point of this podcast. Let's see, what other questions do I have? We we only have like 15 minutes, so let me try to get through this. Oh, do you have any do you know any specific rude things that people have said to you about not fasting? Um, luckily I haven't heard anything, but I've seen a lot of people online saying things like, Oh, well, I fasted during stage four breast cancer chemotherapy. So if I can do it, why can't anyone else? Luckily, I've not had anything, but seeing comments online where people say hurtful like things in an accusing tone, that hurts me. Alhamdulillah, I haven't gotten anything in person. That's good. And I and I hope you don't. I really do because it sucks. Yeah. I haven't heard anything in person either, but I think I would cuss them out. <laughs> If my, mom was there. if my mom's there i just sit there quietly but if my mom wasn't there i think i'd be like oh i so badly want like i want to insult an auntie so bad i shouldn't though as a muslim i should be better that's something that i'm trying to work on i'm working on not cussing people out and not reacting like just if they say something i'm just gonna take their good deeds and call it a day yeah it's so hard though especially with the aunties it is hard it's so hard and i feel like it's especially hard as someone neurodivergent because I often speak without thinking or I react without thinking because I don't really know why but like it's really hard for me to control my reactions yeah yeah okay yes. the next question I guess this is technically the last question is well I guess you answered that one but if there's anything else that you want to say then you could just leave them with a good message going out um 
I want to say as a last message, I know that there are so many interesting topics for debate online on TikTok and Twitter, but let's not forget our brothers and sisters in Congo, Sudan, Palestine, Kashmir, everywhere else in the world, the people who got displaced from Pakistan and sent back to Afghanistan. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Um, We are so privileged to live in countries where we have access to food, healthcare, and um, a roof over our heads. Uh, We're able to sleep in a bed every night. And there are people who are struggling so hard. They are so oppressed. So let's try to think about them. And let's not waste our time on irrelevant topics online. Let's pray. And next time you think about leaving a hate comment, I think it would be really lovely if you could stop yourself and say, why don't I do a dua for the people in Palestine? I think that's the thing I want to I really want people to remind themselves, I guess. No, that was, I loved that. That was so good. That was beautiful. I really hope that they take from that and they they apply that to themselves because I agree fully. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up now because I feel bad I've had you on here for forever. Um, thank you so so much for coming on. I feel like this was such a good episode, and I feel like you have so much good things and like experiences to contribute. And if you would ever want to come back on and talk about anything else, like I'm open to any topics because. I'm also the black sheep and I feel like there's so many topics that we are so passionate about. Yeah. So if you ever want to come back on and talk about a topic, just let me know and I'd love to have you back on. 100%. I hope people don't hate the sound of my voice or what I have to say, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on and um, I was really anxious before. I don't know why. But as um, soon as we started talking, it was great. So thank you for like having me on your platform. I really enjoyed our talk. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you, my love. I hope you have a good <laughs> rest of your night and you're in my dua as always. Same here. I hope you have a good day. It's like, what time is it over there? Is it one? It's almost, two? yeah. Ah, okay. Well, I hope you have a good day and uh, hi to OS and your, and your babies, your kids, oh, the cat. <laughs> Please post them on your story. I miss seeing them. Oh, I should. I know. Okay, I will. Just for you. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, that was our podcast. I loved it. I felt like that was so good. She is such a cutie. And please, please, please do take from her last message. Like, please, instead of being hateful, just take a few seconds and minutes whatever you have to spare and pray for all the people in all the countries struggling right now like inshallah may allah free them and save them that's all i could ever ask for um also take a second to pray for her as well inshallah may she be cured as soon as possible and i don't know how feasible it is to go back to her before life but i do hope inshallah she's able to return to a somewhat normal life you know as normal as she can get so yeah, if if you learned anything from this, I'd love to hear your thoughts, your feelings, whatever. Kind comments only down below. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.